All right, we're uh, we're back here. It's another virtual visit on Penn Live. Dustin Hawkinsmith here. Keith Ergo from the Penn State men's basketball program is joining us as well. Associate head coach, lead recruiter, which I think is a big deal. There you, see, you see his polo right there. Um, and, uh, you know, Penn State doing some really good things on the recruiting front, obviously doing some really good things on the floor as well. So uh, it's good to have you on here. I appreciate your time today, Keith. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. It'll be cool. You know, and, and just as a as a matter of business, Keith can't talk about individual prospects who have, are not with the Penn State program. So that's why we will not be asking any questions about that. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate that thought. It's well, I mean, it's good for it's good. It's good for people too, just to know why we didn't ask certain things. But so yeah. My first thing for you, so you have four kids. You've been doing some homeschooling, I understand. I want, to ask you, I want to ask you this question, all right? What is more difficult, homeschooling, let's say mathematics, or teaching a freshman the Penn State offense? It's, it's just not even close, honestly. It doesn't even have to be math. It could be literally ABCs. Whatever you're trying to do with four children, it's hard enough with one, as you're aware, um, but with four and the homeschooling situation. And look, we forget as parents that the kids are faced with a situation they've never been faced with either. So they're out of whack, we're out of whack. But luck, fortunately, I have an absolute saint of a wife, um, a mother of my children who is very detailed and orient, um, organized. Um, so she, she's been extremely kind of militant as far as it gets, every day starts at 9.30, they get a break in between, and we finish between 12.30 and 1 every day. Fortunately, last day of real school was Friday. This week is like virtual field day, virtual s'mores or whatever it might be. So the actual schooling piece is finally complete. And I can't tell you, it's been a serious challenge in how, and I'm sure across everyone's, but uh, we battled through it. And uh, I think my kids can still read and write, which is the most important thing. So we've done our job. You didn't take that away from them, and I, and I think that's true. And, and I know in my house, like we have one, I'm pretty much like the second child. So, you know, like <laughs> for me to be teaching is borderline, like children and youth services should be called, but we made, we, we made it too. How about from a family perspective? Like I know there are, there are some challenges that go along with this, but at the same yeah. time, I don't know whether what your schedule will be like under normal circumstances, but you're there. You know, you get yeah. to experience family life at a different level than you probably otherwise would. There is no doubt about it. Typically, I'd be in the office by 8.30 during this period of time. And, and though it's not peak time, um, I, I'd be in the office probably until, you know, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock typically, um, maybe with a break in between, go out for lunch or if my kids had an event or whatever it might be. Usually, they'd have some sort of sports practice or something like that I might sneak out to. Uh, depending on how many guys we have on campus. But as a result, I, I've tried to maintain, we call it a routine of greatness. We've been trying to maintain that with our, our roster, our guys on our team from the very week that this began. And now we've incorporated in that our house. Like I said, 9.30, they start. I try to start at nine o'clock. Our staff has Zoom calls pretty much every day of the week, whether or not it's a recruiting call or an entire staff meeting. We have team Zoom calls every week since the first week of the pandemic. So we've tried to maintain a specific structure and what we call routine of greatness. And I've done the same thing at home. And my kids have gotten used to it. My wife's gotten used to it. I've tried to pop in and help when I can, but typically I just make things worse. Um, so they have their space, I have my space. And, uh, you know, but it's nice to have the afternoons typically work till a certain time. They have school till a certain time. And now we can get out and about or do something as a family for a couple hours in the afternoon, which we typically wouldn't be able to do until evening time. So it's been remarkable. It's something that, uh, you know, I'll take as an extreme positive out of this situation. Typically, I get a week in May for vacation and a week in August for the last 18 to 20 years since I've been coaching. And this has been a complete different dynamic. My wife thought she would like it, but I don't, I don't necessarily believe she's enjoyed it all that much and after all said and done. So she'll be just as excited for me to get back to a nine to five, nine to seven uh, for the rest of the summer as I am. 
Yeah, it's, uh, but I mean, I think to your point, finding the blessings, finding the silver yeah. linings, it yeah, has, been so, has been so important. And uh, no. it sounds like you're finding it. And maybe your, your wife will find the blessing whenever you get out of the house again, as you, yeah. as you mentioned. <laughs> Take me back to the beginning of this, where it's, it's March. You guys have fought and battled. It feels like you played about 11 seasons in one at, at certain points. You went through yeah. so much. You have this big opportunity ahead of you. What's the discussion like when you do learn that that NCAA tournament opportunity has effectively been taken away? Well, it was a crushing blow, honestly. And, and everything happened so fast. I mean, I'm scouting um, Indiana, Nebraska um, the, on Wednesday night. We're prepared for shoot around Thursday. Um, you know, all of a sudden, Fred Horberg leaves the, 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 the bench with about two and a half minutes to go in that first round game. And we're thinking, uh oh. What exactly is going on? Then you go back to the hotel. It's all over the news that both locker rooms have been held and Hoiberg has to go to the hospital. And we're thinking to ourselves, if he's got the virus, this is done. Turns out he didn't. But we knew right then and there this could get sticky a little bit. Thursday morning we wake up. We go and we have, honest to God, and this is not, this is not blowing smoke, we had literally what I think is the most energetic most focused walkthrough that we had had all year long. And it was on the heels of three or four tremendous days of practice. Everybody healthy. I mean, we were poised to really make a strong run in the Big Ten tournament. And what we believed in the NCAA tournament, we were so excited to play someone outside of the Big Ten. Yeah. We felt like we were as good as anybody in the nation. We had proved that at Michigan State. We had proved that at Purdue. We had proved that all year long. And we were poised to be able to, to hang and beat anybody that we played from an outside conference in the NCAA tournament. We really felt that way. And unfortunately, when Thursday we got back, we were pulled off the, the court. Well, actually, we, we left the court for our walkthrough, get back, to, um, get back to the hotel, and all of a sudden they had pulled the two teams that were playing in the first round Thursday, whatever it might be, off the court. And at that point, they had announced that the Big Ten tournament was canceled. They had announced – that the NCAA tournament was canceled until the team was actually on our flight home later Thursday afternoon. I stayed in India, Indianapolis because my wife had driven about nine hours the day before. I was going to drive home with her regardless. So the team flew back. On the plane is when the announcement had taken place. When they landed, they heard that news and it was crushing. They took the bus to the, to, to the arena and I missed a team meeting in the locker room, which – I, it's kind of bittersweet. I wish I was there, but I also know how emotional it was. Um, and I think during that time, it was still kind of like, what has happened? Um, but a couple of days later, it pretty much hit us that, no, I'll never get a chance to, to coach Lamar Stevens again. I'll never get a chance to, to coach Curtis Jones and Mike Watkins and, and Grant Hazel again. Um, and then it hit me pretty hard that those guys have, um, they've been family. And we've been through so much since the first day Mike Walken stepped onto campus. We've been through so much and watched so much maturity of, with a guy like Lamar Stevens and what he's done for this university, for me personally, my family, for the, for, for the program. Um, but having said that, we also have so much experience so much drive and passion from the guys that are coming back. They feel like they got cheated, like something was stolen from them. And honestly, they didn't take more than a few days off before they were right back at it. Our leadership, our upperclassmen, John Harar, Jamari Wheeler, guys like Miles Dredd and Myron Jones, they are, and Trent Buttrick, they are, they're, it's almost like they're in midseason form. Typically at the end of the year, you're exhausted. You're like, man, okay, it's over now. Let's decompress. That's not the case. We're even more hungry than we've ever been. We expect to go into games and win now instead of we'll hang, see what's up with four minutes to go. Maybe we can make a run. But no, we, we felt like at four minutes, they better hope they're within striking distance because we're going to be winning no matter who we're playing, no matter where we were. And that seems to be the, the confidence and attitude these guys have had for the last couple of months. So again, bittersweet, but very excited about the future. And that's really what we're focused on now. 
when do you like i mean every team wants to every program wants that mentality wants that attitude wants that kind of confidence or swagger when did you feel like this penn state team adapted that was it was it during this this season was it prior to that yeah it was the last 10 games of last year um when lamar stevens became a, a big time leader um and you saw us finish the season i think on seven and two or seven and three, something like that. And we got a first round bye after going 0 for 10. We were so close in so many games. We felt like we got a couple of them taken from us. We just couldn't figure out a way to flip the script and win those close games. All of a sudden, the last 10 games, we won a bunch of close games. We were as confident as anybody going into the Big Ten tournament. We felt like we had Minnesota. We were winning the whole game. Next thing you know, they come back, make some miracle shots inside a minute of the first round of the Big Ten tournament or second round, and we lose in overtime. But we knew right then and then, right there and then, with everybody coming back, if Lamar decided to come back, if Mike decided to come back, that we were a juggernaut because we had flipped the script. They felt like, now we felt what it we needed we knew what it needed what what was needed inside two minutes of a game we knew how to win on the road we knew how to win close games and everybody was coming back and just older and more experienced it was really those last kind of month and a half of the season from 2019 20. who is uh you know you mentioned lamar in that 10 game stretch emerging as a leader who do you sense is emerging, whether that's from a leadership capacity or maybe, you know, I know there's a, a scoring void, for example, yeah. obviously when you lose Lamar, but who yeah. do you see, you know, as, as much as you can remotely and, and that kind of thing, who do you see emerging? I see uh, a number of guys, honestly. John Harar, as far as a leader, I don't know if there will be any better leader in, in, in my lifetime as a coach than John Harar. He is an absolute um phenomenal human being on and off the court you want to talk about someone who just knows um what he wants his work ethic is absolutely as good as anybody's i've ever met he learned from lamar um from a leadership ship standpoint he is as good as as i think i've ever seen um, and continues to take that role to the next level. Jamari Wheeler is right there with him. Guys like Miles Dredd. But Myron Jones, to me, is a superstar in the making. Uh, before he got sick, his last game was on the road at Michigan State. I think he proved that he was one of the best guards, not only in the Big Ten, but in the nation. I think he's excited and angry that he missed the last six or seven games. He's ready to get back at it and be an elite guard in the Big Ten. Um, I think a guy like Seth Lundy had a tremendous freshman campaign. He's only going to get better uh, on both ends of the floor. Miles Dredd, to me, has probably matured as much as anybody this last two months. You should see his body right now. He's working as hard as he ever has. Um, I think he's going to take an incredible step forward and be an elite shooter in the nation, probably one of the best shooters in the Big Ten, and all around smart players. Um, so I think it's going to be a number of guys are going to take the next step. Guys like Isaiah Brockington, who were, it was their first year in the big 10. Now they understand they had some flashy moments. Now I think it'll be a lot more consistent. Um, but so I think it'll be a number of guys. Um, and I think guys like Trent Buttrick have worked for the last three and a half years and have deserved the opportunity that they're going to get next year. Um, but we also have some incoming freshmen that are really talented, really smart, cerebral basketball players that are skilled, that can make plays. So we're just going to have an opportunity to play so many different lineups, a big lineup, a small lineup, an experienced lineup, a young lineup, a fast and athletic lineup, a slow and deliberate and methodical lineup. We're just going to have a lot of options next year. Um, but the most important thing is we're going to be a lot older and much more experienced. So um, to answer your question, I think there's a number of guys from a leadership standpoint and then obviously a basketball standpoint that are ready to emerge. Let me ask you about the idea of um, criticism. You're like, anytime you're playing a big time sport, you're playing it on yeah. national television. But there's also this sense, you know, maybe, I'm, uh, maybe you're insulated from it to some extent of, you know, every time there's a misstep or every time there's a game that is lost that, you know, a faction of the fan base feels like should be won. It's like the earth is on fire. How, to what extent yeah. do you have to help the kids through that? Or are they, do they, have they adapted a mentality where they are sincerely able to block that stuff out? We work, we talk about it every single day. I mean, you mentioned the word attitude. 
this is the only thing that we're, see, this is for Down syndrome of my daughter, but this is actually, this attitude band right here, yeah. that is a, a uniform for us, um, not only from Coach Chambers, but that trickles down uh, our entire program. Everybody in our office, our coaching staff, every one of our players, our managers, that's the only thing that we talk about almost every single day. And you got to have a positive attitude. You can't, there's so many things throughout your day and your life that you're not going to be able to control. We're not going to be able to control what people say about us, whether or not it's good or bad, how you react from that um, or, or how you think, whether or not you think positive or negative when you wake up, that's determined by your own, your own attitude, your own mental state. You control that. And that's all we talk to our guys on a daily basis is just having a positive attitude and also understanding that without the word fan, fanatic, we're not in the position we are to begin with. The fans are the reasons why sports are so fantastic and that some of these guys are put on pedestals that they might not deserve quite yet. So there's good and bad, and we talk about that. You're a celebrity, which is good and bad in some respects. So if you're going to take the good, you've got to be able to take the, the bad. And, and honestly, Coach Chambers, to me, is a tremendous leader. He's going to take it on the chin for our players any which way he possibly can and try to keep it off of them. So, I mean, we just have to educate them every single day and talk about being positive no matter what. And I think throughout our nine years, it's pretty remarkable when you come to, we could be 0 and 5, 0 and 10 or 10 and 0. When you come to a shoot around or a practice and you're an analyst or you're a fan, you'd have no idea whether or not we were 10 and 0, whether or not we were 0 and 10. The energy, the passion, passion the attitude, um, is the same every single day. And that's why I think we're, we finally built a program that we feel is going to be sustainable in the Big Ten, in the top five of the Big Ten, top half of the Big Ten for years to come. Whether it's that attitude or some, some other things, what are you looking for? And I guess, you know, the attitude thing, you can kind of go round and round, I guess, about whether a kid yep. has that or whether that kid can be taught that. But yep. what, what kind of stuff – outside of what you see on film, outside what you see on the floor, what kind of stuff are you looking for attribute wise off the court in, in a prospect for Penn state? What is important to you to look for? Oh, well, our, our culture is everything. So you have to be able to fit our culture. Your character is everything. The, the bottom line is what we've done at Penn state and what's been imperative for us is to see talent or individuals that we believe are going to fit what we're trying to do at an early, at an early stage. So we develop relationships with a lot of our guys, sophomore, some, in some cases, their freshman year. Guys like Lamar Stevens, we were recruiting when we were recruiting Shep Garner. We started recruiting Tony Carter, Lamar Stevens, and Isaiah Bostic. They were freshmen. We had relationships that were authentic and real for nearly four years before they decided Penn State. We vetted their, their families. We vetted their um, their AAU organizations. We just, we try to develop real and authentic relationships with guys. Um, and we're at the stage now where we um, finally can, it's, we pick and choose based off the type of individuals, what schools they come from, what coaching they've had, what, um, what type of families they have, parental guide, you know, factors. Um, and we're not just going to take it, the, the best player. We need to take guys that literally understand what it takes to be a Penn State basketball player. Um, and fortunately, we have a tremendous culture at this point where guys come in and now they have leaders above them they can follow. Like, for instance, Lamar Stevens, he might not have had that when he was a freshman. And he, he, he came in and needed to play 25, 30 minutes a game as a freshman. Well, Seth Lundy came in and he had Lamar Stevens as a senior. He had him in high school as a freshman. And Lamar was a senior. They won a state chip, a Catholic league chip. And now he comes into Penn State and he has that guy to look up to, that guy to witness, okay, how's he doing things in the weight room? How's he doing things uh, in the community? How's he th doing things in the classroom? I want to learn from him. So it's become a different sort of model throughout our nine years. We feel really good about the type of individuals and families that we have that are going to become a part of Penn State men's basketball and the community, really. So, you know, to circle back, you know, I mentioned when, when things start to go a little south and, and what, the, what the vibe is. Uh, yeah. what, one of the other things I hear, just fandom and that kind of thing, is 
you know, you know get the idea of getting city kids to state college. You'll never be able to do yeah. that. Well, clearly, you know, Philadelphia has been such a good connection point uh, for obvious reasons. You guys have roots there, but clearly a message yeah. – a message is resonating with those kids to what yeah. extent I guess is is that getting city kids to state college like fact or fiction is that is that a real thing that you have to do some convincing and and what's the message not, to those guys it was it was originally it's not so much anymore you know guys like TJ Newbill set the tone um guys like Shep Garner um and obviously Brandon Taylor um we've had so many here in the last several years um, and it was just, I, I don't necessarily think it was um, where the previous staffs had their roots, like you mentioned. You know, that's where Pat Chambers is from. All of his relationships are from there. He knows every high school coach. When we were at Villanova, I was there for four and a half years. Coach Chambers was there for nearly five. We had some incredible years. We developed some tremendous relationships along the way. And it's really about relationships. And quite honestly, I just think. A lot of those kids didn't realize it was a viable option for them, you know? And now that they understand you can come here two and a half hours away and you can play in the Big Ten on the Big Ten Network and you're on national television every single night and you're a part of the largest living alumni association in the world, and life after basketball is as powerful as life during basketball, that you have an opportunity to move away from home and become your own human being and out of the city and out of the inner city where some of these kids come from, which are tough. But also you have the opportunity for your families to come visit on a regular basis. They can come up for the games the night of and go back the night. You can go home on weekends if you need to, but you're still out of the hustle and bustle of the city and some of the things that you might want to get away from. And, you know, kids are gravitating towards that. And um, obviously our success has also uh, been a part of that. But, you know, when you hear Coach Chambers talk, and, and Penn State sells itself, I mean, the brand is tremendous. Like I said, largest living alumni association in the world. But when you finally get kids up on campus, and they see the tradition, they see the passion. Um, and obviously, it's a college town. If you're a college athlete, a basketball player, football player, whatever it might be in Penn State, you're treated pretty well. And they feel that they feel that energy. And the degree speaks for itself as well. So it's just the entire package. You just got to get them there. And once you get them there, they're blown away. They can't believe it. They want to come back the next weekend and the next weekend. So um, it sells itself a lot. Take, I'll leave you with this, but take me back to the beginning of recruiting Mike Watkins all yeah. the way to present day and how hard you guys might have celebrated you know, this kid getting his college degree, nothing really has come easy for him, I, I guess, in a, in a lot of his life. And that includes his time at Penn State. But no he, got to, he got to the finish line. And, uh, you know, how significant is that kind of victory just for everybody in the program? There's never been a greater moment in my coaching career than when Mike Watkins got his degree a couple Saturdays ago. We cried together on the phone. Um, our relationship started when he was a sophomore in high school and he was at Mass Civics and Sciences. Um, and obviously he and I will be close for the rest of our lives. And he knows anything he ever needs. He can always pick up the phone. He's a part of my family. He's a part of this, this uh, community forever. Um, you know, but it's, uh, it was an emotional time. We've been through a lot together. Mike is as resilient of a human being as I have ever been around in my life. And I think some NBA teams are starting to take notice of that his resiliency, his ability to, um, to be mature enough to put himself out there like he did. It took a couple of years. And finally, I think he realized not only just for himself, but how many other people he could touch and affect if, in fact, he spoke openly about some of the issues that he has. Um, and I, I think as a result, once he did that, once he put it out there, he felt such a weight off his shoulders. He felt so much more comfortable that he kind of, he took the next step both academically, both socially and emotionally. And, um, you know, I can't speak enough about his resiliency um, and, uh, and really the university, the university and Sandy Barber, Pat Chambers and, um, and the rest of the university community embracing him for what he is and what he brings to the university. Um, I think he'll be a Penn Stater for life and his legacy will live on for a long time. 
And again, I can't be more proud of him or the university. Um, but Mike Watkins getting his degree is without a doubt. I think Coach Chambers would say it, the same thing. Is the most uh, um, uh, was the most emotional experience that I've had as a coach, even more so than the Final Four. It was pretty wild. Keith Ergo, Penn State associate head coach for the men's basketball program, lead recruiter, talking some basketball, talking some recruiting here, a virtual visit on Penn Live. Keith, we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Dustin, I appreciate it, man. And please stay safe out there. And uh, again, have a great weekend. Same to you. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. This has been a virtual visit on Penn Live. We'll see you next time.